Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in the Scottish Parliament's fifth session. Uh, I would ask everyone in the room to switch off their mobile phones as they can interfere with the sound system. Uh, the first item on our agenda is subordinate legislation. We have one negative instrument before us today. The instrument is Health and Care Professions Council miscellaneous, miscellaneous Amendments Rules Order of Council 2016, SSI 2016-693. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Could I invite any comments from members of the committee? No. Okay. Uh, are the committee agreed that we make no recommendations? Yes. Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, agenda item two was on GPs and GP hubs. And we have two evidence sessions today. I'd like to welcome to the committee uh, Dr. Shan Tucker, Clinical Director, Lothian Unscheduled Care Service, um, and a representative of the Royal College of GPs. Um, Aileen Bryson, Head of Policy Scotland at the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. Gabrielle Stewart, Policy Officer for the for Scotland College of Occupational Therapists. Uh, and the representative of the Allied Health Professionals Federation and Theresa Fife, Director of the Royal College of Nursing. Um, we're not expecting any opening statements, um, so I'll move directly to questions. But before that, I suppose I should uh, declare an interest in that my daughter is a trainee occupational therapist. Um, first question, um, would any members like to open up? Or maybe I could op open up and ask you to... Um, Maybe give us your understanding of how the GP hub uh, model is uh, going to operate or is operating. I think I would um, address that back. It's, there's three types of hubs that I'm aware of, and I wasn't sure which one the committee was interested in. So I don't know if you want me to expand. Yeah. So there's the urgent care resource hub, which was... Um, sort of uh, postulated by Lewis Ritchie in his report from last year um, and for that that's talking initially about out of hours and bringing together all services in a hub out of hours including the GP out of hours but plus community nursing third sector mental health services social care so so that's sort of one type of hub and since Lewis's report um, was published there's been money made available from the Primary Care Transformation Fund uh, to each board to look at developing new models of care, including the Urgent Care Resource Hub. And although initially it was postulated for out of hours, it could be used 24-7. The other two types of hub, the Scottish Government and NES are doing a pilot with what they're calling community hubs in Fife and Forth Valley. Um, and these, I don't know if you know about these ones, but these uh, have at their heart GPs, and they take GPs who've just qualified post-CCST. They do a fellowship for a year, um, working with hospital colleagues, uh, learning some new skills, and then for two years they're in health board-funded positions as community physicians. They're running slightly differently. The Fife model is a day hospital type model where they're working with integrated teams. Um, the Fourth Valley one has some inpatient beds as well. And the third type is um, there's an integrated hubs which have been developed across the country, locality hubs by the integration joint boards, bringing together services, um, usually in hours, and providing a single point of access for GPs and for patients to access these services. So the hub is quite widely used at the moment, and they're the sort of three ones that I'm aware of, and I wasn't sure which ones you were interested in. That's helpful, very helpful. Anybody like to come in at this point? No. Um, what do you see as the uh, opportunities that we've got to try and change the way in which care is provided through this model? Yes, Teresa. I think that there lies a problem which has just been described very well there as we're using the word hub in many different ways and perhaps that's something we need to unpick. Because um, sometimes a hub is seen as a structure, as a building, as a co-location of service. And that might be helpful, but it's not necessarily if it means the patient or the public or more junior staff have to have long distances to access that, that structure. 
Other times it's about a network, and a network which in fact describes better than one which is for trainee GPs, but the network could be wider in terms of the network, because if you are talking about integration, you're not just talking about healthcare professionals, you're talking about social services, you're talking about third sector and other sectors. So I think that the network model is one that we would support, because actually in order to deliver what we're doing, we need to work together. Um, for us, and I hope you've had a chance to see the set of principles that were put together by all the primary care professionals that came together, and we believe that it is really important that we actually focus on primary care and, and really be clear about what we mean and where those services are and what support people need. But that sometimes is not always easy when some of the funding models you're going to hear about, which are the pilots, tend to focus on one professional group, like GPs, rather than really focusing on the multidisciplinary team, which is what we're hoping to get across today. And that can be from across all of the team and really support that in a way that drives that type of working. And that might be multidisciplinary, but it could be multi-agency as well. Because if we're at the heart in primary care, within community, it's important that we actually drive things that way. Hey, Alison? Um, yes, just picking up on, on the point that was just made, the allied health professionals in your submission, you highlight that, that issue that we're speaking about multidisciplinary you know, collaboration and, and moving towards that, but there still seems to be a a uniprofessional nature of workforce increases. You know, you point out the, the GP increases, and I'm not suggesting for a second that they're not needed because they're very much needed. Um, but what support do you think we need to genuinely facilitate this move to a more collaborative model? Scotland uh, pointed it out, actually, that there hasn't actually been a real shift in funding in, in a sort of workforce planning way for a multidisciplinary team. It's been very uniprofessional. And the other thing that hasn't really happened is to really look at... Uh, who's coming to the door of GPs and how many of those people could actually be seen by an AHP rather than a GP. I mean, we appreciate that, you know, we'd all like more workforce, but it's which workforce do we actually intelligently use? And I think we suffer from a real lack of statistics around allied health professionals to actually build a body of evidence because we're often not um, recognised within the ISD and within other statistics as well. So having a representation or having some kind of analysis of who's coming in the door. And the other thing that we suffer from is that often the perception of what people think we actually do isn't actually right. So we've, we've got a good example in Brecon where looking at physiotherapy um, and a triaging to physiotherapy, uh, it was seeing at backs and knees and not thinking about the broader role of physiotherapy around public health and occupational therapy. And the other AHPs uh, suffer from the same misconceptions of what it is that we actually can do. Thank you. Can I come in? Yeah, thanks. Um, I would agree with the three sentiments that have been expressed already um, and the lack of clarity around what a hub is um, has, a, has come up in all kinds of ways. When health and social care integration was first talked about, um, then we've seen lots of emerging um, virtual hubs. And so I'd agree with what um, Theresa said about not um, concentrating too much on the building, but actually looking at how we actually service the local population. So we originally thought that was where the hubs were coming from. I noticed that in the committee papers, you talked about GP hubs. Uh, our response has talked about community hubs because we think you have to be thinking mm -hmm. in the round. From a pharmacy perspective, then what we're seeing, and we're very, very pleased, is an increase in recognition that pharmaceutical care is, is an essential part of that patient care. And with that, a willingness to have a pharmacist as part of the multidisciplinary team. And we're seeing that in all the different models which are emerging in lots of different ways, which is, is very heartening for us. Um, we're really pleased that what in the circular which came round about the new funding uh, for the 140 pharmacists, there is a commitment from the government to evaluate the new models because I think going forward we actually have to evaluate everything that's being done so that longer term we actually have something robust in place um, I resonates with the comments about pilots and generally we hear that lots of good work going on, lots of pilots, sustainability can be a problem. Thank you, Convener. Um, the committee on a previous occasion were made aware of the NUCA model in Alaska, which, I, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, comprises a GP, a pharmacist, a mental health practitioner, um, and admin support. 
um, and I may not be entirely right as to who the team is, but it's, uh, it's led to significant advances in reduced waiting times and, well, they don't have waiting times. You just get seen on the day that you, you want an appointment. Um, I just wonder if the, the panel would could reflect on if uh, in the community hubs that exist right now, if there are spokes, as it were, to that wheel which should be there which aren't at the moment in terms of professionals who you would like to see more of in that team? Um, I think from the Urgent Care Resource Hub, which actually is being developed with a multi-professional funding model, so it, it isn't a, a GP funding model, it's, it's a multi-professional one. Um, I think one of the areas that we have realised is physiotherapy has a big part to play and we're looking at adding those in as well to, to the hub. And the other bit that was highlighted in Lewis's report, which is often forgotten, is the third sector, particularly for mental health. Um, the, the number of mental health calls in Lothian to the out-of-hours service have increased 41% in the last four years. Um, so it's an area that we really need to address. And at the moment, all of those are dealt with by a GP, which isn't necessarily the best use of resources. So I think by um, increasing particularly mental health, but although we've been given money to set up an urgent care resource hub, this isn't recurring funding, so we can't employ lots of new staff. We have to rearrange what we've got, and, and that's one of the challenges, particularly within, I would say, mental health. So using the third sector, which is out there and is brilliant at some of the mental health care, may be a way we can get over that. Some of those are 24-7 as well. So I think we need to be um, open to new ideas about who we can use and how we use people. Um, and certainly the third sector would feed into that. Yeah, I'd just also like to add that occupational therapists are working in um, Wales around a project of, with GPs on mental health alongside their art therapy. So there are AHPs that also do uh, support people with mental health issues in, into work, and I think the whole employability aspect is also something that we need to think about as well. talking about really fits very well for Scotland and you'll hear later evidence from very you know, remote areas in Scotland because it's that geographical model that we always have to consider. Too often sometimes the city models drive what goes on and in fact though if you're in Glasgow or somewhere you have as much of a travelling distance to get from one side of Glasgow to the other but it's actually the access, I come back to that again about how patients access the service and how the staff who provide the service access if there is limited public transport then they're not going to do that. But coming out to the point we we're making, though, about Sir Lewis's report, we were part of that work along with others here at the table. And we all said at the time that it's so obvious that when we did out of hours, it's, the link is obviously with daytime, but we tend to actually treat them differently. So we've done an amazing piece of work, I would say, on out of hours as a, a group together and came out with a new model that was going to actually drive that forward. But we were so frustrated so often because actually what needed to happen was we should have looked at the whole picture together. Because, in fact, it doesn't really matter who finishes at five. It's about that continuity. It's about how you ensure that, in fact, there is that change of practice that happens, as many of my GP calls would tell me, that four o'clock call on a Friday afternoon before actually they face thinking they're going to face the weekend. So there is something for us to learn about that. I do wish we had had the courage to say we'd have made that whole one model for the 24 hours rather than saying this is what's there. So multidisciplinary is well recognised within the out of hours, well established in the way of going forward, but it isn't necessarily in the actual day service yet. It is there in principle, but it isn't what's being carried out. And an example of that is IT and e-health. At the moment of funding a GP model, which I don't, this is not meant to say GP shouldn't have what they need. This is not what that's about. But actually, that GP funded e health model may not talk to other professionals, may not talk to pharmacists. So, yet again, we're doing something that's actually stratified for one group, when the whole idea we should be going forward is to say that the patients should expect all of us as healthcare professionals and other agents to be able to talk to each other and, in fact, ensure that we are sharing information. Even. Yeah, um, thanks, convener. Thanks very much for coming along this morning. There was there was two things I wanted to just um, just just kind of raise. One was round about um, if you look at um, the GP resource. I mean, it's an expensive resource. It's a constrained resource, and clearly the, the 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 objective of a lot of what we're talking about is how much of that work can you move away to other professionals. So I suppose I just wanted to get your your view on how far down that road have we gone. 
And in a perfect world, how much further can we go down that road if you'd a blank bit of paper to, to just um, have free reign to go and design the thing? How much of what GPs are doing today do you believe could be done by other professionals? And the second question was, thanks very much, Dr Tucker, for your run through the three types of, of uh, hubs, and I was struggling to take a, get notes. Of it. So if you could maybe just go back through that, but with a specific emphasis on the funding the model that, that lie behind those, because I think you kind of hinted that, that, that they're funded in, in different ways, which might be part of the difference. And very finally, um, community hospitals, um, how are they different in your view from what we're talking about in terms of community hubs as such? Um, okay, so the three different types of hubs, as far as funding is concerned so far, the community hub pilots in Fife and Fourth Valley were, came out of the seven-day sustainability task force um, and are funded through that uh, and are in conjunction with NES. Um, I have to say I'm not sure if that is a three-year fixed funding or what the plans are for that. It is, um, there's an evaluation plan to see how that looks. Uh, the urgent care resource hubs um, the 10 million from the primary care transformation fund has um, is in the process of being handed out to boards so that they can use it as they wish so they might not all use it to develop urgent care resource hubs but they may use it to develop something like that um, and so and that is a one-year fixed funding there's no recurring funding for that the integration joint board locality hubs are being funded by the integration joint boards um, again by reorganizing what they already have because there's no new money for that um, so that would be the funding streams okay. and just to address that none of the community hubs that I'm aware of certainly not the urgent care resource hub would be for patients to travel to that the urgent care resource hub would either be a virtual or a geographical location with staff sitting in it who would sort of um, so we, we may have our, uh, out of hours have actually our own hubs, which take the calls from NHS 24, and they would pass on the work to the GPs who would be on the ground in the GP emergency centres out of hours. So it wouldn't be that patients would have to travel to this new location, it's just this new location would organise the work and send it out to the community nursing teams, or may be able to deal with it by phone. Um, as far as the GP resource is concerned, I think there's two things. I'm not sure we should be um, focusing on improving other work as nurses, physios, pharmacy to replace GPs. I think it's work that should have been done a long time ago to recognise the need of a multidisciplinary team. And it's come to the fore now because of the GP crisis. But actually, I think we should recognise them for the unique skills they have and what they can bring to patients as opposed to saying, because we haven't got enough GPs, we're going to parachute in these other people to, to cover the work. So I would sort of turn it round and say that um, primary care and community care is a whole multidisciplinary team and we need to recognise what jobs people can do. And I think there is some work going into that. The new, new GP contract um, will probably move that further forward as GPs concentrate um, more on what they only they can do, the, the, the complex care, things like that. But um, I think it's important to value the multidisciplinary team for what they bring, not just gaps they can fill, if that makes sense. Um, yes and no. I don't, I, I don't disagree that what GPs do is very, very valuable, but that is not the same thing as saying that GPs could also be doing things that they don't need to be doing. Oh, yeah. No, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. GPs are doing things that could be done by other people. And, and I suppose what I was trying to dig into was, can you kind of give an estimation of that? And I know it's hard. Is it half of it? Is it 10% of it? Is it? And how far down that road have we come? Because at the end of the day, that is the, that's where the solution lies, isn't it? Uh, just as, as an, as a, an adding to that, it's very difficult to quantify that. I'd agree, um, and I agree with what Sean says about looking in the bigger picture and longer term. Um, but with, there has been having small pieces of work which can kind of give you an indication of things. Um, there's some work which says some figures around six percent of 
um, who turn up at A&E could be dealt with by minor ailment service and community pharmacy and around 10% of who turns up at GP practices could be um, dealt with in community pharmacy through the minor ailment service. So there is a bit of also about, going back to what was said about the third sector, about educating the public on going to the right person at the right place at the right time if that service is available for them. So there, there's that. Um, there's been some work done with the new funding looking at um, how much time a GP spends on medicines-related queries and acute prescriptions um, in their surgery every day. And that varies on the practice, obviously. That's the thing. Every practice is completely different. Maybe between one and a half and three hours a day, maybe 40 to 50 acute, respond, um, ac you know, acute requests, which can be dealt with by the pharmacist. So th that's where the evaluation is going to be very, very important because we don't actually know those figures yet. We just have the principles to guide us on actually making sure that everybody contributes what they can contribute. And then the Welsh are using a phrase at the moment, only do what only you can do, which I think is kind of an interesting little nutshell to put it in. Um, and although there's a crossover in that you, you, everybody does a little bit of everything when you have one person in front of you, then, then there is something around that. And it is about us all contributing what we've got uniquely, but, but linking it together. And as Theresa said, the IT is part of the enabler for that, which we don't have at the moment. Yes, I think that um, that transition. So we don't really have the data that would demonstrate what you're asking for, but we should get it. And I think without understanding that, because I would agree with Shan, it's not about um, not wanting GPs or recognising their expertise or not wanting nurses or physios. It's about valuing the expertise. A good multidisciplinary team builds on relationships and actually bringing the best of each other to a team. And that's what we should be after. But the public need to understand that. And unfortunately, at the moment, we use a message all the time which just talks about a GP practice. And then we say to the public, actually, if you come here, you should be seen by a physio or a nurse or whatever. We should get that better because actually, if we don't, they tend to think there is actually a crisis within the service. There is actually a shortage of GPs, but there's also a shortage of other professionals. And that's not ever debated very often. Going back to community hospitals, I think they're a vital part to play within this, but not everywhere in Scotland's got community hospitals. And again, that's what I meant by not getting focused on buildings, because some people have des designed a model that's based around a building they have. But if you didn't have the building, then you haven't got anything to focus it on. So that's why we're saying be more virtual. And I would agree with Shan, without question, the way the urgent hours was working within out of hours was not around a building. It was around actually, again, a focus of actually how a team. But community hospitals have a very good part to play in this. And actually how they are seen as part of that community process of enabling people to be more local than actually always actually being with where they need to be. You said, how far can we go? We've gone very far, in fact. But what we haven't got clear yet is the referral processes to allow those professionals to act independently. We haven't got the means of them being able to access the patient record in the same way across all those teams. So it's not much use you saying to the patient or the public, I will treat you and see you, but I can't actually do what I need to do or you might make the wrong recommendations. You don't have all the information. So we're going to have to really be brave enough. And it is hard because we tend to think of the record as being one group's record. We're going to have to find a way of actually working with that across all the disciplines, or otherwise we're not going to do that. So it's more about some of the processes we could do to improve it um, in order to make that happen. Um, yes, I'd fully support that, and I think access is hugely important, and what we don't want is GPs acting as gatekeepers or referrers to other services that they could directly access, so I think there's a lot about educating as well, where you know you can directly access to an AHP, but the public won't necessarily know that, so I think there's a lot of work to do around forming an intelligent network that really understands what the resource is and how you access that, and that would apply to the third sector as well. Donald? Really about pharmacists, actually. Um, yesterday I visited a, um, a community pharmacy in the Highlands and um, it was a high street pharmacist. It, they were saying, and I'm sure this will be familiar to you, but they were saying with more, in, with more infrastructure and more investment and improved IT around things like accessing patient records, they could do a lot more. Here we're talking about putting pharmacists into general practice. And this may be an unfair question, but which of those models is better? It's no better model. We have to look right across the piece. 
um, two thirds of the profession working community. If we're to have the capacity to actually um, work as a multidisciplinary team in and out of hours, we have to use every resource that we already have, and it's about working smarter. Um, Theresa referred to the out of hours response, which we did um, collectively um, across the professions. There were lots of ideas in there, and I think there are lots of ideas to develop community pharmacy um, where it works in tandem with the pharmacists working in GPs' uh, practices. Uh, it's, it's ideal for a community pharmacy to, pharmacist to be liaising with a pharmacist that's working in the GP practice. They can talk pharmacist language to each other mm. and they can deal with the medicines related queries really, really quickly. That pharmacist should be a conduit. There are models where um, people work part time in community pharmacy and part time mm -hmm. in the practice, and that actually has advantages as well. Again, it goes back to we need to look at all the different models and think, you know, what would work best in that locality? In some places, it's only the community pharmacy that's there. You know, geographically, there's not many other health professionals around, so you have to have a different model in, in that respect. Um, it does, the, the IT is an enabler. There has to be a culture of sharing information between the professions, first of all, which is, um, and then the IT obviously helps with that. So at the moment, I'd say there is no one ideal model, but we have to make sure that we bring all sectors of the profession together with this and actually be very smart about how we, how we develop the services. Remember that out of hours to a GP practice is not out of hours to a community pharmacy because they're open much, much longer hours. Um, there have been pilots where a pharmacist in the borders was given access to records because he was the only health professional around on a Saturday afternoon. So lots of different ways of working <clears throat> and lots of good stuff going out there. We just need to actually sort of have a look at it in the round and bring it together. So it's not an unfair question, but it's a difficult one to answer because I, I agree. there's and there's different models. Tension, there's a tension, but, but we don't want to replicate resources. But at the same time, I, I'm very interested in them working together in, in community and in practice. And, like, and it can be done. And there yeah. are some, some pilots out there trying those different models, which is very, very mm. good. And as we go forward, I think, I think we've all talked about workforce planning in various ways, but workforce planning will be important be, because we need to make sure we support all the different sections. We know that pharmacists are really keen to come and work in GP practices and they're moving from other sectors and we don't want to disadvantage one part which, which needs to be developed as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with you know, what Gabrielle said about the referrals. There are a lot of instances where you have to go through the GP to do it and you could actually be much, much smarter and make it more person-centred and make the patient journey much, much smoother and get it right for that person first time if we were enabled. And that would take some, there's some legislative changes that need to be done. There's some contractual changes. There's, there is, the, the phrase transformational change is not overly dramatic because that is what's required. Hours period, um, we already work very closely with community pharmacies. So most boards have what's called a professional to professional line, where if a patient presents at a community pharmacy, they can contact um, a GP and get a call back within 15 minutes. So the patient doesn't have to go through <coughs> 24. So um, we find community pharmacy incredibly useful um, and. I agree that the more skills that they have to manage patients within the community pharmacy would be very helpful for us because, as Aileen said, they're often open out of hours um, and we, we do have a very close working relationship with them. Okay. Uh, Marie. Hi there. Uh, I have to declare an interest because I'm a pharmacist and I'm registered with the General Pharmaceutical Council. I worked for 20 years as a clinical pharmacist in a psychiatric hospital specialising in mental health. And I suspect, I mean, we talk about our profession as being hidden in full view. So um, I suspect my colleagues around the table might benefit from hearing a little bit about the different roles that pharmacists do in terms of hospital pharmacy, hospital clinical pharmacy, um, primary care pharmacy, what that's traditionally been and what it's going to be going forward, and the community pharmacy as well. And also, um, I'm interested in, you know, I, if for having been a pharmacist for all those years, I know that there have been um, long been a recognition that the level of education that we have and the, the level of knowledge that we have is possibly underutilised in the health service. I see that way back in 2002, the government recognised that pharmacists were an underutilised resource in the health service. What have been the barriers to 
you know, bringing the profession on and e enabling them to participate more fully in healthcare. So, if it, you know, if it was recognised back in 2002, why hasn't it happened by now in 2016? Well, wow. these things do take do, do take time. I think somebody I think was Sean mentioned earlier. There is the driver at the moment is the shortage of GPs, which has 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 driven things forward much faster, and that that is fantastic. Um, but it, it's about you look, looking in the longer term, the bigger picture. I think as a profession, we have been very not very good at shining our light, and uh, the focus has always been on supply. We've not been very good at actually emphasising that intrinsic to that supply came patient safety and you were never supplied a medicine until the pharmacist was happy that it was safe for you to have and we've not been very good at getting that message over to the the public and then there's lots of other layers in there in that we're we're changing from what i call the harry potter world of lotions and potions in the last century to somewhere where we now have complex much more complex care if you think back 20 years People who are in a care home now would have been in a geriatric hospital in 20, you know, 20 years ago, and primary care has been asked to do much more um, than it was. You know that shift between primary and, and secondary. We're moving to an, a, an era which we all know about the demographic changes, where we have people living longer. They're on a, a, a many, many more medicines. When I started practicing, somebody with diabetes would maybe have two or three medicines. Now it's not unusual for them to have 15. So. We, we don't make up medicines anymore. We actually produce the, the pharmaceutical care to make sure that that's, that complex array of medicines is safe and to try and minimise how many medicines um, somebody is on. So we're not good at letting people know that we've had that five-year master's degree and it's all about specialising in all aspects of medicines. Um, there's a group through prescription for excellence at the moment talking about valuing medicines which we're involved in and that's about getting the public and patients um, involved so that we get a bit more um, idea people know what um, a, a doctor does they know what a nurse does I think the allied health professionals probably suffer from the same as we do that not everybody knows what a pharmacist does and we have to get much better at getting that message out there so that when we have this hub not a GP hub but this team mm -hmm. people understand where to come to to get that um, advice and I'm happy um, we've done some visits and we've met with some of the committee but obviously we're happy outside this meeting to discuss bits and pieces of that further thank you Marie of GPs was fantastic but anyway, <laughs> maybe. well don't look a gift horse in the mouth <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, Gabrielle, then Marie, uh, Marie, we'll go back to you if you want, Marie. I think there was just one more point around leadership as well and who is commissioning and making decisions. And I think that we've struggled to get representation sometimes at the top table so that we can share what our expertise is. I believe they're going to be forming GP clusters, uh, which aren't necessarily going to be um, coterminous with the integrated joint boards. Um, and there's going to be a quality cluster lead for each of these clusters and, and I suppose what I'm, I'm sort of wanting to say is that we want to make sure that that is truly multidisciplinary and, and, and um, reflects the people that could potentially make a difference to the people's health of Scotland. A chance of defining clusters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Marie, do you want to come back in? Or? Um, just, I'm, I, I, I'm interested in some of the barriers um, to community pharmacy to getting more involved with the multidisciplinary team. So you mentioned about um, how straightforward it is when there's just one pharmacy and one GP um, practice. But it's much more challenging for the usual high street setup where anybody from any GP practice can walk into a community pharmacy looking for um, pharmaceutical care and I know, I mean I've done my prescribing course, I know that one of the challenges is that it's very difficult for a community pharmacist who has the prescribing qualification to prescribe for people coming through the door because the prescription pad is linked to a GP practice so they can't prescribe for anyone coming through the door. I wonder if again from my colleagues around the table who aren't pharmacists you could explain some of these um, barriers to f community pharmacists getting involved in the more rounded clinical practice. Um, the, the funding in the past um, was set up so that a community pharmacist would go to the GP surgery and have a backfill locum pharmacist to work in the pharmacy. Um, um, I think pharmacy, community pharmacy suffers from being in a retail environment, which differentiates it, differentiates it from being in a practice and, and a surgery. So the pa people and patients don't 
and we immediately uh, you know to have the same attitude going into what they see as a shop whereas as i say the the background work that's been done before they actually get the end point of a, of a package um, is is what they don't see and it's about the package of care not the package so there's, there has been funding and legislative, and there are contractual difficulties there, which are barriers. Um, the kind of things we, we hear anecdotally are um, concerns about confidentiality, if somebody's speaking over a, a, a pharmacy counter, which is why um, consulting rooms were funded way back um, as part of the, the right medicine. Um, and so there's something around um, that understanding that the confidentiality in a pharmacy is exactly the same as in a GP surgery with the reception staff. Um, and I think it, it, they do suffer structurally from that and not having the IT links um, and the funding for the prescribing. But there have been, it, it, there's, if the IT links were put in and if we joined up the services, there, the community pharmacists could be doing very many of the same things that the pharmacist in the GP surgery is doing. Um, that that is not is not um, a difficult wouldn't be a difficult thing to do. And um, I think the more the public saw that joined joined upness and referrals between the different professionals and referrals from the the, the practice. Um, because we know we, we know that people turn up at GP practices who should be at minor ailments we really want to get them to be sent to the minor ailments so that they understand that's that's where to go rather than have that treatment in the practice taking up time in the in the practice and um, so those barriers are there they're not insurmountable um, and I think um, with a um, slightly nuanced view from um, policymakers and funding then there could be a lot of improvements in that and developments and the, the out of our um, developments there were short term medium term and long term things which could quite quickly you know be put into place um, to actually uh, create take down a lot of those barriers and so the public would understand that the community pharmacy can be a go to place and there's two levels where you have to think there's the accessibility of having a high uh, a health professional on the high street where they can ask for that information and then there's also the pharmacy staff there who can help with public health and, and actually have that as a healthy living um, area. So that there's, there are two different things going on there um, wh which have to be recognised more. I'll come back to you for time at the end, Marie. Colin, and uh, then th Teresa. Th thanks very much, uh, convener. It's been mentioned a couple of times that the, the, the driver for, the, the, I suppose, the current emphasis on the hub model is the, is the current GP crisis, fantastic or, or otherwise. But, but I think it was actually Theresa made the point that, that, that there are other workforce difficulties in other parts of the primary care workforce at the moment. So to what extent do you think that the other primary care professionals involved are prepared for the, the, the proposed changes that are likely to come forward? Uh, and from a capacity point of view, how readily can the other health professionals actually pick up the work from GPs? I'm just thinking one example is, is the proposal to recruit 140 um, pharmacists, for example. Where are these pharmacists going to come from? I think workforce planning across the teams is not good enough at the moment. We wouldn't have a clue about a projected number of either pharmacists or physios or OTs or nurses within the primary care team. Um, because we do tend to still focus on, at the moment, the real data they've got is actually whether how many GPs they have, and that's what we, we tend to refer to when we talk about primary care. So we do need to get a better baseline of what we have and then understand what the growth is, and I think my colleagues referred to that earlier on, how workforce planning has to look at those disciplines. We've had funding um, put out for 500 advanced nurse practitioners. There isn't 500 advanced nurse practitioners out there. They'll be growing them, but unfortunately what's happening as soon as one area develops a set of them, another area robs them because they're short. And so it is actually at the moment, I'm afraid, the, no the notion that there is actually always other professionals. The thing that I want to just come back to, and I really was into comments that Marley was making, is that the way of working multidisciplinary is actually about a way of working with respect for each other. And so it's not just about whether there is actually barriers for pharma, um, pharmacy, it's actually barriers for the team to work. Those barriers are there. I've mentioned a few of them already. IT, means of referral, means of accessing, how you get respect and integrity for each other. So it's not about one against the other. It's about actually how you do that. And I would say this has been someone has been around a long time now within our professions. Perhaps we've moved out of very silo professional thinking into better multidisciplinary thinking. I would say... That would have been a time we wouldn't have actually had many shared opinions on these things a few years ago. It would be about our own profession. 
But coming back to the final point is transition and funding. If you look at the pilots of the, and the testing, we're really into that. It's a big thing at the moment, so we pilot and test everything. I'm very worried now that none of it seems to go actually into a, a change. Because if you are really short of money, and I've been in that place in a board where you're in development and someone says there's money, you'll take it because you want to try something. But actually shifting the resource from what you currently provide to actually enabling the resource to be there to employ permanently the people you need in those teams is really hard to do. So people might have ideas of having a wider team, but they won't have the long-term funding because actually the pilot ends or the test ends. If I was a manager right now out there, I think I would be I would just be a lot at a loss as to which of these pots of funding would be best and what would actually give me in the longer term the transition that we need actually. So that's going to be an issue. So we can't always grow people and then employ them and get them into place so you can get the better team working. So that would be a perennial problem. And some parts of Scotland more so than others because they do have problems with recruitment. Just on that point, is the temporary nature of these, you know, you know, the more pilots than Heathrow type of scenario. Is the temporary nature of that a barrier to people going into it because yeah. they think, well, I'm only going to be in for a year or two, then it's all over. And how are we going to end up, yeah. if this is the model where we're heading for, yes. how is it going to become sustainable? Well, our workforce planning is, pre is actually predicated on how many posts you have. So if you're piloting and testing, you actually don't have a post. You have a temporary nature. So when you're forecasting your forecast plan, you'd say, well, I need 15 AMPs or advanced nurse practice, or whatever. People won't say that if they know they can't employ 15 AMPs mm -hmm. because actually it comes down to that's the funding you have. And if you train people and then you can't put them into a post because you don't have the funding. So we're, in a, we're really in a difficult place. I like pilots too. I like testing. We're just doing too many now. We think that's actually transformational change. I'm with my colleague. Transformation change is doing something much more radical than piloting and testing. It is about saying, this is the team that we need. This is how we need to do it. I'm being prepared to do workforce planning, actually, in a way. But people won't go into a job that they know that, in fact, is going to be ended within a year. Or, in fact, the training for advanced first practice is really, really hard. And it's actually got to do a huge commitment. Quite rightly, it is. It's actually very... Uh, um, important it is but why would you do that if you don't think you're going to get a job at the end of the day you know so we have to find a way of actually looking at more the permanent changes we needed rather than reliant on funding that's going to run out and been two to three years. Um, Sean did you want to? Yeah it was partly to say looking because the funding is short term what we are all having to look at is using what we have in a different way um, and I think, as Ivan pointed out, we don't know what percentage of um, GP workload can be transferred over. So we're not absolutely sure how many of everything we will need yet. So I think trying to reorganise what we have and having some funding for that and some time and space to do that is essential. And then we can look at by measuring and getting some figures and some evaluation about what we need going forward. And that's going to be where we need the money because we are going to need money going forward. And as far as um, developing multidisciplinary teams, I think that's absolutely brilliant. But as has been mentioned repeatedly, the, the GP workforce crisis is one of the main issues. I don't think, however many multidisciplinary teams we develop, we will be able to replace GPs, nor do I think we should want to replace GPs. So we are going to have to grow our GP workforce as well, even to, to stand still, because as well as the GP workforce crisis um, being a driver for development of multidisciplinary teams, it's a changing demographic and the amount of care, you know, the 2020 vision, people want to be cared for at home or in a homely setting. And to do this, we have to change our view, which at the moment and in the press and everybody talks about is hospital. It's a cute view. There isn't a big view about primary care. And for the NHS to sustain, it's going to have to be primary care. Uh, Claire? Hey, thanks, Convener. Um, thank you very much for the briefing papers that you provided. They were really helpful in terms of setting out a vision of what uh, the multidisciplinary team could potentially do. But what I'm hearing in a series of answers to questions is that there's a real uh, lack of um, statistics, of evidence of how GPs' time could be spent better or things that they're doing that other professions could pick up. 
Um, and so how are we going to demonstrate uh, in the long term that actually to expand the multidisciplinary team is a benefit to, to everyone? So can you tell me what, what you're doing as professional groups to actually look at statistics, look at trying to build up some sort of evidence base or some sort of baseline? Gabriel? A lot of pilots as AHPs that have been really successful and will have the statistics and the evidence, but there's no forward funding, so it's been funded on a temporary basis. So we've had some fantastic examples that then stopped because the, the, the money hasn't gone with it. Uh, one of the concerns I have, as well as incentive, what incentive is there to work in a multidisciplinary way? way and it's about being collegiate it's about trust it's about lots of things but it's also what is the incentive so yes um, there's a gp crisis we have other aging workforces as well so it's if, if we can see it as a whole workforce and a whole offer and understand that true offer I, I mean i sometimes think what is the dream team we don't know that yet and it might be different in different places so yes we do need to test but we also need to make really brave steps because at the moment i think we're just tinkering with with pilots and i would really agree with Teresa in that regard. I think we need to be much braver. I think all the professional bodies have their own evidence base. I think from, you know, we've all got our own stories that we can share. It's about pulling it together in, in a sort of systems-based, network-based approach and understanding the full offer of, of all of the workforce. The question in two parts, really. I think we heard earlier that um, as of now, right now, 10% um, of people presenting at GP surgeries could be dealt with by the minor ailments um, service at the local pharmacy. Um, I wonder if, uh, whilst we can't quantify this exactly at all, but um, I wonder if we, th there was a way that with the uh, resolving IT issues so that pharmacists could have better access to notes, they could see um, what people were already taking, and public awareness, how much more of that GP workload could be taken on by community pharmacists if we got everything right. Um, and then secondly, um, we're all aware on this committee that um, one of the biggest areas in, in growth in terms of demand on the health budget is in GPs prescribing, and that's a, about the demographic, it's about the aging population, people living longer um, and needing support to do that. I wondered if, if there was more of that coming through pharmacists, is there a, a, an opportunity to rationalize that or, or reduce that just through the added expertise that pharmacists have in what they're prescribing, not to belittle the prescribing powers of GPs, of course. I said earlier, it's not all about taking the workload off of GPs. It's about filling the gaps in patient care so that each of us around the table and all the other professions that aren't here are actually contributing in their unique way um, so that the patient actually gets the most benefit from the whole primary care team. Um, and... The prescribing, um, pharmacists have always had a role in the governance and the decisions of prescribing. So that happens in the GP practice um, and in the managed service more than it does in, in community. The, back to the referral systems, um, it, there are times when there's changes need to be um, done to prescribing which could quite easily um, with an independent prescriber and community be done without actually having to go back to the GP. And that's a very simple way of saving time um, because we, we both know what the end of the conversation is going to be, but you actually legislatively have to go through that process. So there are lots of small things that can be done to save time. If you think about where the minor ailment service is, then at the moment we have a minor ailment service which is suitable for certain parts of our population to go to uh, as the first port, as using pharmacy and community as the first port of call. So if that's okay for some of the population, why is it not okay for everybody? Um, so I understand the government is committed to having a look at reviewing it, which we would wholeheartedly support because it could be widened out. There are other things which could be done within the minor ailment service. Um, there was a project a few years ago where we actually um, uh, used, had some pharmacists who did some of the... Um, minor illness training, which they could do quite quickly, which meant that in hours, they actually used this for out of hours, but had they used that in hours in a normal day-to-day -day business, that could actually have helped the appointments at the GP surgery as well. So expanding that minor ailment service, reviewing it and how, how it works, um, and then thinking about better direct referrals to all the other professionals without having to go through unnecessarily to the GP. And and then it means that when you do have to contact the GP, it's because it's, it's, it's when the GP is actually needed. And there's always been the system of red flags where the, the, the pharmacist will refer, and that happens all the way through. It's a domino effect. So um, lots that could be done. And the 
we would really welcome um, a, a review of the minor railment service to think how do we better triage people and use that opening which is accessible long hours as the first port of call and make it the, um, there are some pharmacy first pilots going on and again we'd like to see that opened out more we've we're running short of time, so we need to be really quick with answers and questions. Uh, Gabrielle, can you Yes, I just wanted from? to highlight that some H HPs are um, prescribers as well. And also a little bit around the associate physicians and link worker roles that are often mentioned at the moment. And we think that you're bringing in new professions or new roles when you've actually got an existing workforce that could fill some of those posts or uh, and more successfully and actually be able to, to uh, support people um, through their professions rather than these unregistered um uh, workers uh, so it's really just to think about the workforce as a whole but also be very very careful about announcing about new workforces that could come forward when you haven't actually really understood what the offer is from the current one yeah that's, that's a really good point it's, what's concerning is that it is often about what i meant about not about relationships and structures it's about who wants to employ people and like to have that line management responsibility and we have got a bit of focus on thinking we'll find a new role yet we have a team there we could work differently with and i would say that is absolutely can i just make a point about clear and data absolutely key isd have got to change what they record and what they start to actually do with data primary care workforce survey comes out very shortly which you'll see it it is only about the GP practice and those who are employed within a GP practice and doesn't capture all the others we've just been talking about here today. So we do need to get better data. Miles. Um, my question relates more to um, the real new gatekeeper potentially in a GP hub would be reception staff. And how do you think they can also see professional development to make sure they're directing people to the right um, professional, you know, for example, 30% presenting in a GP caseload should be going directly to a pharmacist. I think 15% um, are actually phoning up to get advice on medication and um, repeat prescriptions. Where can that conversation be had at the initial stage of someone phoning up to make sure that they're not phoning up to say, I want to see my GP, and then you find out where to actually send them? Um, I would say in the urgent care resource hub, which we're talking about, most patients will still go through NHS 24, so we'll have had a bit, you know, a triage. But we're also, the Highland Hub has um, a GP or a clinical presence within it some of the time, so that there is immediate support there. So you're not putting receptionists under pressure to make clinical decisions. Um, also, in Out of Hours, some of the money that we've uh, bid for from the Scottish Government in Lothian is to put our receptionists through customer training and increased training for them as well. Uh -huh. So I think it's concentrating on the wider team and not just medical or nursing within it, so to try and get training. I think the, the GP practices, there's no plans that the GP practices would change the way that they work at the moment, that they wouldn't suddenly all change into GP hubs. So I think reception will be important to signpost. Um, and there's a lot of that that's done already, and there's a lot of um, posters and advertising in GP practices about where you can get help. And I think we need to be smarter about that. What had been mentioned in the Ritchie report, and I think we do need to think about, is maybe more national patient education as well. Not just about where they can go to get help, but about self-care, because I think there's a lot of, of self-care stuff that um, maybe particularly younger patients now contact healthcare professionals. Certainly as a GP working out of hours, I deal with a lot of things that my granny would have told me about when I was little. So um, I, I wonder if we need to look at that as well. We have been discussing, uh, sort of focusing on ensuring people see the right professional at the right time, but I just wondered um, if you had a view on how these primary care reforms will help tackle health inequality. I mean, some of this has been driven by the fact that people are living longer, but there are a lot of people who are not living longer, and these are people who are very hard to reach. So I just, you know, I know we're short of time, convener, but just, you know, your opinion on whether or not this will actually help those people. Point. That's why I kept referring to access, and absolutely some of what we're doing is virtual models, but if we become focused on the building, and we know already that those who actually have um, not got, you know, their, their lifestyle isn't actually the way it is where they would turn up at an appointment in a practice, in a centre, there is an issue already. What we mustn't do with these new reforms is actually risk the chance of people 
getting to the service they require and making it more difficult for them to get to. I believe, in fact, if we open it up the way we want to go with other disciplines, there is actually more of a chance to actually ensure that people have accessible services because there's more people they could go to if they feel they have a barrier with one particular professional because that can happen, that they perceive that professional as not actually paying attention to their needs. So it is the most important. All through the Out of Hours report with Lewis, I kept saying, do not do anything that actually maximises inequalities. Mm -hmm. Be careful, because professionals can be very good at fixing it up for themselves. That makes it better for them and doesn't necessarily make it better for people who need the service. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would just say that I think what we are aiming to do here is offer new routes and not shut down any. So if patients turn up and still want to see their GP, then that will still be available. We're not talking about shutting anything down. We're talking about giving more choice and hopefully providing increased access for people who find it daunting or intimidating to access through the normal routes. Um, there's a couple of things. Um, when patient education, um, I've always felt that we should, patients, everybody should get something like, you know, the yellow pages or whatever it is that comes every year and you keep it and it actually guides you through what you should be doing. Has, has any of that been, I, I, I shudder to say, piloted? <laughs> yeah, there's a, there was a Know Who to Turn To campaign which mm -hmm. would um, highlight who to go to for what in different areas. I know um, there's just being an app developed as well because uh, about patients um, can look on the app and find out what's open and what's accessible in their area as well. I don't know of any phone books or yellow pages. No, I'm talking that, about a similar thing. Yeah. That you keep in the house that's a, yeah. a, you know, something that you can go and reference any time that tells you basically the pathway that you should be going if you've got ailment A or ailment B. Yeah. I mean, if you're telling me that, I bet you most of the committee here didn't know there was an app or a... No, the, know, the app is, is, is um, just in development. It's not out right. there yet. But the Know Who to Turn To campaign, I think, started in Grampian and they had leaflets and everything that went out about where... Only Grampian? Not many no. places. Do it. Certainly no, not no. But it has come out a wee okay. bit further. Um, finally, see, on the, um, the... How will we know if this has been worth it? How will we know if it's, you know producing the goods and value for money and how's, how will we assess that? There, it's, it is difficult with healthcare to make targets and quantify things because you can, you can, if you focus on one thing, you can inadvertently topple things around otherwise, but there are some qualitative ways you can look at things. We're encouraging pharmacists to do audits in their practice to benchmark. You can look at patient surveys, you know, what's the quality of life for the patient? Uh, in, in care homes, you can have things like, you know, uh, your better appetite, uh, less swallowing difficulties. It's there's less time for the the staff to actually do the medicine rounds. You can look at un, unplanned hospital admissions and referrals. There are lots of markers. I think Shan mentioned though we do have to have the the time to actually do that. And it comes back to what's been mentioned already about the thoroughly and robustly evaluating what's there and looking at the different ways of looking at it. But there are different measures you you can take and with indicators because it goes back to my point the data we currently collect wouldn't tell us we're going to get there it would tell us some things I think we have to recognize that the data that's been done for some time has fitted the service as it is we have to step back now think what that new service is what that new model and find the outcomes and indicators and actually change the data collection that we do um, and actually start to get somewhere with that okay Yep, yeah, Sean, you want the final? I was just going to say, as well as um, I think we need to ask patients, as you said, I think we need to see if patients prefer it, but also I think we need to ask staff. Um, an incentive for working in a multidisciplinary team is it's fun. We need people to work in the health service. We need GPs and we need all these other professionals. So we need to make it an attractive career as well. So I think we need to look okay, at both. final point, Gabriel. I think this ties in also with health inequalities. So we need to make sure that the people that we're communicating with actually understand us. And I think I, I can feel my um, Royal College of Speech and Language therapist behind me um, screaming that we need to be a communication nation as well. We need to make sure that uh, people who... Uh, you know, experiencing health inequalities do actually have access to all the information and services. Thanks very much. There is, um, I'm really surprised, and I don't want you to come back in this because we've no time, is that no one has mentioned social care in the whole hour, which really surprises me. But thank you very much. <laughs> or oh, maybe you did and I missed you. If I, if I did, I apologise. Oh, here we go, here we go. <laughs> but... Uh,
I think it's a big issue that um, we didn't get into. The, the we didn't get into, and we should. We maybe should at a future time. Thank you very much, and we'll just suspend briefly.
Uh, could I welcome to the committee uh, our witnesses for this morning, Dr uh, Elaine McNaughton, uh, who is a GP and Deputy Chair of Policy for the Royal College of General uh, Practitioners Scotland, Elaine Thompson, Locality Team Leader uh, in the Pharmacy, uh, Dundee Health and Social Care Partnership, and a representative of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. Christopher Rice, who is a Senior Charge Nurse, NHS Shetland, and Linda Harper, Associate Nurse Director, NHS Grampian. We're not expecting any opening statements, so we'll move to questions. We have um, got a very limited time available to us, so short questions, short answers would be helpful, and not everyone needs to answer every uh, question. So, um, Would anyone like to begin? Richard. Uh, good morning and welcome. Um, I've been sitting listening to, the, I'm sure, the first panel. Uh, one of the questions which we didn't really get into too much was the fact that over the years doctors mainly had their own premises, um, were leaders, managers, employers, basically an accountant, uh, managing everything within their, their own practice. Now that the GP contract is currently being, being negotiated and hopefully will be set up by 2017, what way do you think the contract should go? Uh, do you agree that um, within, I know we have one doctor and other professionals, uh, within the situation, do you think that we should have the doctor concentrated with the other um, professionals rather than uh, owning the practice? Um, the, I mean, obviously, what you're referring to is really the independent contractor status that um, GPs currently hold. Um, it is ex it is. The, the new contract is not going to bring any fundamental change to that um, model. Um, there's sufficient evidence out there that that is, in fact, um, undoubtedly the most cost-effective way to deliver primary care at the moment. And we could have huge widened debate around whether that model facilitates or creates barriers for the sorts of really constructive things that have been discussed earlier. Within that model, however, um, we still have a very strong underpinning philosophy of team working. And in fact, I would suggest that in fact that model supports team working. GPs take on a responsibility for employment um, and for managing the, the, the unit, if you like. And in fact, um, but within that, and, and do continue as leaders in that, um, you know, within that model, but working very, very much in a mutually valued team. Now, my experience, and it's very interesting, because I mean, I will be 30 years in my practice in November, and I'm hearing all this discussion around teams. And in fact, one of the things that when I moved into practice 30 years ago, that really I valued most about being a GP was being a member of a really comprehensive team. And within my building, I had a full team of not just um, our district nurses, we had our practice nurses, we had um, community um, psychiatric nurses, I had a midwife um, working with me, um, we had visiting consultants, all working within my practice. Now, so we're not talking about a new model, we're talking about overcoming barriers that seem to be making it more challenging to maintain that underpinning philosophy. Um, so, so I think that I don't, I mean, I don't think the contract will um, change the model substantially. I'm not sure that that's necessarily going to overcome, you know, even considering that will be over, will overcome the barriers that we've discussed earlier. Um, I do think that um, one of the things that we've said repeatedly, I, and we will say from the college, is that we need to continue to have sufficient GPs in order to continue the model. Um, one of the other barriers, and I know you say short questions, one of the other challenges we face with the teams is creating a culture where each individual professional feels confident and supported and trusted in making their decisions. If we're going to really fully develop these roles as we've just discussed earlier, each professional needs to feel safe in that role. And I think with the you know I think the current climate is perhaps an unsaid barrier to um, the professional development of each of the different um, professionals in fully in, um, embracing the model that has been discussed in the earlier session. So, We've gone about safe in that role. Pharmacists, at the end of the day, could possibly dispense prescriptions, could, as far as I'm concerned, could actually sign prescriptions. Every time I spoke to a doctor in, in, in any role that, uh, I've had in this committee, 
Uh, they continually, not complain, but they continually tell me that they're an hour, a couple of hours, sitting, signing prescriptions. Now, we've got um, pre-signed nowadays, we've got computers, we've got a printer. You know, why can't the prescription, and I know the reason why, but I want you to tell me why, uh, the prescription can come off the printer straight away. And, you know, most prescriptions are repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, you know, so why can't we take that time away from doctors signing, can, you know, spending all that time spend checking? Why can't we shift it to someone else to give it them the responsibility? We would absolutely support that, in fact, we can, with the right, um, with the right structures in place <coughs> to support that. I mean, we've presented the joint paper that um, the Royal College of GPs and the Royal Pharmaceutical Society have, um, which describes exactly that role for pharmacists working within practices. There are some, um, there are some uh, administrative and legislative processes need to be sorted in order to allow pharmacists to sign their own prescriptions. But provided a pharmacist feels that they are working within their competence and are su suitably supported by the systems and safe systems that allow that process to happen, then we would absolutely support that. And, and, I, and I think the key thing is around having um, helpful and supportive systems for any of us working in practice, because that same that applies to GPs as much as it does to pharmacists with regards to safety of prescribing. Can I just come in on that one? There, um, we do now have different systems in place that allows us to um, to take some of that workload away from GPs. We have the chronic medication service, which allows us to assess suitable patients, and if they're stable, they're well controlled, they're managing their medication, there are no issues, we can put them on a serial prescription, which basically is for up to a year. So these are people who have been assessed that the prescribing is safe, and that can either be a GP who does it or the pharmacists who work within practice can do it. Equally, the community pharmacists who are working with these people on a day-to-day -day basis can assess how well controlled and how, you know, how motivated, how stable these people are. And we can then give them that option to have a one-year prescription, which reduces, you know, if somebody's getting a, a prescription every two months, that's reducing your contacts with the GP from seven to one. If they're on monthly prescriptions for whatever reason, that's reducing it from 13 to one. And that service has a whole load of safeguards in there to make sure that these, these, the people who are on that service are supported with their medication, they're reviewed for any issues they have taking it, any safety issues, any side effects. So there's a whole new service that supports that and will take some of that workload away. But it'll let, and pharmacists themselves can actually set all these things up, they can assess and they can review patients. So it, it is, it's definitely there. Yeah, and of, of course, it's back to the multidisciplinary team, isn't it? That, you know, there, there are other disciplines who prescribe, nurses, AHPs, and many nurses will, will run their own chronic disease management clinics, and they will sign, you know, they will see the patient sign the repeat prescription um, if that's within their area of competence. So it is back to team working and working together to support everybody within their workload. I think I have to agree. I think there's a, there's a systems issue. I work as a, an advanced nurse practitioner uh, and I've got legal rights to prescribe and I prescribe on a daily basis. Uh, working with my, my colleagues from pharmacy and my GPs, um, coming up from a, a Shetland point of view, we do quite a lot of anticipatory care. So we can anticipate in the community what we're going to prescribe and put mechanisms and frameworks in place to support people in the community. So rather than going to a GP, the, the, the drugs will necessarily be available to the patients in their own home, which prevents a GP admission and also freeze up GP's time as well. I, I also think that it goes back to a point that uh, Linda was saying about um, competency. We need to stick with our competencies with our prescribing. And I think from working within the GP practice, I see numerous prescriptions, hundreds of prescriptions, and the GP just, just simply just flicking through them. T to me, I would need to sit down and go through each one of them. So I think it's a time pro issue, and I also think it's a process issue as well. Thank you. I'd just like to pick up on, a, on an issue that I raised with the previous panel, and I guess I'm hearing here that there's there's lots of work being done by other professionals um, prescribing, which uh, would take time away from GP prescribing and, and save time there. So how are you quantifying that? How are you recording that? What what? How much GP time have you saved through employing advanced nurse practitioners or having a uh, pharmacists in uh, GP practices? I, I work in the main in the, in the out of hours arena, so um, we have a, a, a multidisciplinary team there where we have doctors, nurses, social workers, um, 
mental health nurses, although we've sort of lost them and that is a big loss to the team. So, so we will continually assess um, our prescribing and we continually assess you know, but we have an annual patient experience. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but you're not actually answering my question. What I'm asking is how much time has been saved or how much money has been saved and how have you quantified that? that uh, time is, is it's very difficult to identify how much time we have saved. But if you look at the team, the team is, is probably now from being a full GP team to a, a mix of um, probably... 65, for, 65 GP, 35 nurse practitioner. So therefore that's a lot of time taken away from the GP actually writing the prescriptions for the patients because we are seeing the patients our, ourselves. But we've actually never audited the, the time that it actually takes to... And I suppose it, it, it takes different time. It depends how complex that patient is because you're assessing and okay. so it could take you... I, I, sorry, Tinta, I'm just really aware that we're, we're running it. You, you, Christopher, okay, so it's time we've about, not, we've not about um, your change, change of practice in Shetland. Have you quantified time there in Shetland? I don't mean your person, but has Shetland Health Board looked at what was happening before, what you saved? I mean, we've just we've just initially practice? gone through the. We again, we have issues with recruitment in sustainability GPs. So we've just employed um, five advanced nurse practitioners. So we are producing statistics in relation to ISD um, for the amount of work that community nurses do and the nurse practitioners again i think it's a systems issue in a sense of the i i give you an example i spent six hours doing statistics last friday for isd and numerous other things that takes me away from patient's care so i think there should be something integrated within our computer systems and the package to actually record this which is what we don't have at the moment okay so so the so answer is that's no essentially yeah there is, i mean just one of the, the, the things that's very complex, I think that, I mean, and how I quantify my 10-minute appointments is very, is very complex. And to be able, and there have been many attempts to try and quantify what time is allocated to what element of the work. And, and quite frankly, that's not practical. And certainly within the constraints of the, the you know, the day-to-day -day work and the pressures of workload at the moment, it's not possible, I think would be fair to say. Because each, many of these projects are done in, they're in, you know, in small boxes, if you like, Again, that makes it very difficult to actually quantify in bigger terms. There have been a number of study. I mean, there, there is a, a fairly recent study on, on um, the use of, of, of for example, um, pharmacists in doing certain roles in, multi, uh, in chronic disease management. And in fact, cost effectively, it's not looking terribly optimistic, I have to say, if we're, we're certainly looking at cost savings in a, in, a, in a model that we have described. I think there's sufficient evidence out there in its entirety that, that shows that one of the most cost-effective and cheapest ways of getting through the biggest numbers of roles is for GPs to do it all in a winner. Um, and that's very crude, but in fact, that is the suggestion. However, the reality is that we have a shrinking, you know, we have a, a very stressed workforce that can't deliver, that is struggling to deliver. So we have to be creative. So you're absolutely right that in order to do that in a meaningful way and to order to ensure um, the public out there that we're making the best use of resource, then we really need to be having some of these answers. But uh, it is complex. It is very difficult to tease it down to that level of black and white. I don't think we'll ever do that. And I think what we'll have to do is complement as much pieces of evidence in the context in which we're working. Because the reality is, if we were to do that, I would I strongly believe and suspect that we'll have GPs running one-man shows and producing a very cost-effective service. I don't think it'd be the best care for the patient by any means. But if that's the sorts of things we're looking at. So I think we need to look at the wider picture. I think we need to look at the quality of care that patients are getting. I think we need to go right back to what we discussed already about the right person providing the right role for each patient for the right, you know, in the right area to look at this in a wider way. Whilst we are trying to get our heads through the complexities of what measurements will be useful and helpful in contributing to that development. So, just reflecting on that then, are you saying that this is all driven by the lack of GPs rather than uh, the desire to improve patient care. Yeah. No, I think that's I, I mean, not I know it's not as stark as that. Yeah, I, th I think... But is that, that is is that first point that the principal driver? I think the other principal driver, which was referred to in the early session, is the change in demographics of our population. I think um, we've got many, many more patients being needed to be looked after at home or near to home with multiple conditions and increasingly complex needs across their care, both social care, and I think I think it was mentioned at the end, 
social care and the investment of social care is critical to this. As a GP, I have to say, one of my biggest frustrations on a day-to-day -day basis is not being able to manage my patient at home with my community pharmacy support, with my district nursing team support, with the other support, because I've got insufficient social care support. So actually, that's critical to it. So, but I think that, you know, in answer to your original question, not having the clinical expertise of GPs or the holistic, comprehensive skill base that GPs have to offer is one driver, but also not, you know, not meeting, changing, significantly changing needs for patients, I think, is the other key driver here. Marie? I'm interested in, in the models of um, practice that are out there. So um, you talked about being a GP and part of a, um, you know, running a team. Um, and you mentioned several different kinds of nurses. I think traditionally, probably allied health professionals and pharmacists weren't a part of that team. And I'm interested in how you think they might be incorporated into the GP team and also whether it's happening across the board. So I'm well aware that there's big practices near me where I live uh, in the Highlands, which don't have any nurse prescribers, which seems astonishing to me. Now it is, you know, I would have thought that the nurse practitioner should be running, um, you know, regular health um, care for chronic um, illnesses, you know, like asthma clinics and things like that. The other thing I would be very interested in, in hearing is from you, Elaine, about the chronic medication scheme. What sort of level of uptake is there of that? Um, how many of the target population do you think are, are, are using that scheme and what are the barriers to using that scheme? And the third thing I'd be interested in hearing, we touched on it in the last evidence session, is about the, the minor ailments scheme. I've heard people talk about expanding that, and I would love to hear from the panel here whether you're talking about making that available to more patients or whether you're making it um, available to cover more illnesses. I've heard from my community pharmacy colleagues that there's pilots going on to treat UTIs, to treat impetigo, and to possibly treat exacerbations of COPD. So how do you see that going to, to reduce the uh, workload of GPs and put some more of it into community pharmacies? I mean, I'll just answer very quickly with regards to the wider team. I think you're right. I think the pharmacy role in practice was, is, is a very much um, a newer expanding role that, that is, it wasn't something that the community pharmacist has always played a big role, but this is new. And I think, I think that is quite very exciting, I think, from a GP point of view and for, for development of pharmacists. Um, I, I do think, um, um, so you're, you're around allied health professionals, I mean, interestingly enough, we... In the times of fund holding for GPs, and I'm talking 1990 plus, we um, used our funding to set up open access physiotherapy in our practice. So again, that concept is something, and, and the patients really loved it. It was a really useful resource. The pharmacists, we worked as a team, we worked under the premises. So these models have worked, and again, it's about supporting those. But very much, I think the other point you made is absolutely right, there's a huge variation and I think when you talk to Elaine about the chronic management sch uh, scheme as well, there's huge variation for a whole variety of reasons. One thing I think it's important to say at this point in time, which has been raised as a potential, um, as a current potential perceived barrier, is the whole issue of sharing patient records. And I, I do think that's a critical, um, because if we're talking about community pharmacists treating UTIs, um, exacerbations of COPD, we need to have um, sharing of that information across the all the healthcare professionals who are delivering that care. Bec otherwise, we will not have the holistic care of patients that we really need to hold on to and that the college would support in our vision document around what good primary care should look like for patients as outcomes. And one of the legislative challenge there, and I think there's a, a lack of understanding of this, is that GPs currently are the data controllers of the, the, the patient information. So we carry responsibility, legal responsibility for the, um, for the confidentiality of that information and for the systems that support it. Now, I don't know what the solution to that is. I suspect everyone in this room will have a different idea of what the solution, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that needs to be redressed. I think it is, and legislatively. I think if we're going to go over that, I think, I think if we're going to have true sharing and comprehensive records that the right professionals have access to in, a, in, in the right way, we need to revisit a model that support, you know, and a legislative process that supports that. Okay. So I, I think that's it.
think, Elaine, you possibly want to uh, talk about the chronic medication scheme. Yeah, in the interest of time, I'll, um, I'll just pick up on the, the CMS and the minor ailment service. The, um, the chronic medication service has been going for a few years, and you're right, the uptake is not as good as it, as it could be. There are various reasons for that. Um, some of that is, again, it's to do with IT. As usual, it's always to do with IT. Um, you know, it's quite a back-to-front system. They have to register with the community pharmacy before the GP practice can set up the serial prescription, then they're going back. So, you know, that all needs refined. With any new system, um, there are loads of IT issues, and what we're doing is we review and revamp it, and we change it, and we develop it as we go. Um, some of it are as, as simple things like patient factors. You know, I've... I've, um, I've talk to people about getting set up set up on these schemes and they like the independence you know they like going to their gp to get their prescription they like going out to the pharmacy every every week so, you know there are some of these cultural things that potentially need change but you know you're balancing that against workforce pressures within practices um, so there's a lot of work that we need to do in terms of rolling that out a lot lot further because potentially it does have a, a massive impact on GP workload, but also in terms of, of the pharmaceutical care that we provide for people. It's an ideal service that allows us to improve the pharmaceutical, you know, the care that we give. It takes it away from being purely a supply function and actually focuses on the care. Um, just to pick up on the, the minor ailment service, what we are looking to do is the minor ailment service is currently available to people who would not have paid for prescriptions. What we would like, is, as Aileen mentioned earlier, is we would like that extended to everybody so that anybody who has a minor illness can go to the community pharmacy and, um, and be treated for that. We are also looking at how do we develop that beyond the minor ailment service and what's currently prescribable from that to um, some more complex conditions so we can start moving more people away from GP practices and into community pharmacies. And through NES, we, have, um, we now have the Common Clinical Conditions Training Course, which is actually upskilling pharmacists, giving them the skills to diagnose and manage more than just what's on the minor ailment service. And to do that, we need to develop a lot more independent pharmacist prescribers and sort out all the issues that we have around pharmacist generating prescriptions. Convener, I would just like to ask Dr McNaughton to expand on a couple of points you made. Um, you said that we're not talking about a new model here, um, but we're talking about overcoming barriers to maintaining the model that, that you've clearly practised with for some time. Um, and you also spoke about insufficient, ca insufficient social care support as a barrier. Do you think that discussion around this inadequate social care support needs to form a greater part of this discussion, primary care reform? Absolutely. Absolutely without question. I think, I mean, I, you know, the, 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 the health and social care integration was, I think, underpinned by a recognition that um, it might be a more efficient and um, co collective way of addressing the, co the combined needs of patients. But there's absolutely no question that social care is absolutely crucial. And the third set, we've talked about, you know, others, the third sector, voluntary agencies. There are, a, there, there are that wider team there who can deliver a significant support <laughs> to what is, you know, to patient care as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, the very short answer to your question is absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, you wanted to add to that? I was just going to, I would just, I totally agree with what with the comments you were saying. I, I think we have two models. We have a rural model and an urban model. I, I live in, I live in a world where the shops still close at five o'clock at night. It, it's half day Wednesday and shop and Sunday is a is a wash day, um, and 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 that leads to, to issues in the sense of that we, we still have issues in the sense of that we have a finite access to resources. We have two hundred and two twenty two thousand population on Shetland. Um, we have minimal resources that we can access to within health and social care. We, the, the money is there, which is great. However, we don't have the physical resources to actually put that in place. And I think with the health and social care as it merged, we have, we have a board that, that works great. It works on, on the ground because people like myself integrate with, with our health and social care to deliver care packages for our patients. But when you look at, at the middle of, of the, the management, it doesn't work due to simple facts of, of logistics, IT systems uh, and actually how the, the, the joint board works and I think that needs to be addressed to combine with all the other out of hours reviews. Just, just to go back to your other question about models, I think we need to be creative with models. I think what I was saying was the principal underpinning philosophy of having multi-professional teams working together is what we're working from but how that's actually delivered in practice will vary enormously depending on the context with it, within which it is being delivered and the needs of the individual patient population that's being served. 
and the geography, of course, that that, uh, that Christopher refers to. I think there's no question that all of these things need to be need to evolve, and therefore the pilot sites that are um, testing various different ways of delivering that um, are, are are certainly going to help feed into that um, intelligence. I don't think there's any doubt as well is that whilst I talk about that, that is absolutely not the way it has been for that number of years across across Scotland. I think that's very, I, I, you know, I'm aware that was relatively unique within the practice that I, in the community within I worked because the community setting and the geography facilitated that and the systems and the management systems and the structures of the different healthcare professionals and how they were managed and deployed facilitated that. So I think, you know, the, no, there absolutely is not going to be one model fits, fits all for it by any means um, but I think that, that you know I think and, and as I said to, said before as well I think the other question around different professionals working being able to feel confident and working autonomously is a, a you know quite a cultural development that is going to where, where there needs to be a, a, a feeling of confidence and freedom to work within your competence mm -hmm. without a fear and I think that that's that is another culture that needs to be overcome within the healthcare system that we're working within at the moment, um, and, and so I, you know, I think these all contribute. Thank you, Thank you Convina. Um I was uh, very struck in the last presentation with the revelation that ten percent of patients who present to uh, GP surgeries could actually be dealt with in the minor ailments communities. Then, in the margins of this meeting, I was speaking to the Royal College of Physiotherapists, and they point out that actually as much as thirty percent of uh, patients presenting who have musculoskeletal conditions could be dealt with by physiotherapists. We've touched, uh, Dr. McNaughton. You touched on the barriers in terms of data control. Um, and that's a legislative issue. But I wonder if you could expand on that and, and identify any other potential barriers to moving some of that workload out of GPs' um, surgeries and into other professions. I think it's been alluded to already. I think we have a workforce challenge across each professional group. We've already talked about, I mean, I have two nurse practitioners in my practice, but I felt jolly guilty because I pinched them from other places where they were equally needed. So I don't think there's any doubt that there is a workforce challenge. That's perhaps a, a key barrier. I think the other thing from a GP perspective, um, which is difficult to measure, is that when I see patients in my 10 minute consultation, I will deal with their musculoskeletal problem, I will sort out their medications, but actually what they came to see me about was something different. And therefore, how we evaluate that and how we make that efficient and effective. Now, I think that there will be a great deal of that will have to go to patient choice. Patients will need to be helped and, and, and aided in the information they receive about the, who the most appropriate person to access for their um, particular um, need at that particular time will be. But actually, it will be a complex, um, evolving process as to how the holistic care of patients and the other issues that we deal with in a consultation, not least of which are the associated mental health um, problems, um, the stress in society, the other things that impact patients' um, um, present presenting problems, and that is complex. So I think there is, you know, I think that will be work in progress in terms of what patients learn they get in terms of the best, have their needs best met. There is absolutely no doubt that as a professional there are many, many things that I'm absolutely the last person that should be dealing with in terms of the skill base within the team. And that it's not, I'm not, you know, and I should be seeking the help of my colleagues where, you know, where I can if the patient presents to me. And similarly, when patients present to the physios or the pharmacists, they will need to, it is likely we'll need to seek help from each other. So that will be key to how that works well. But, you know, patients' needs are complex. They very rarely present to me with one problem. And even those going to, fit to physios. And that's the challenge, that we, how we meet that in the most efficient way we can. I think, I think there's, uh, there's a lot that we need to do in terms of, because um, we talk, we've talked about increasing the awareness of the patients and the public around how they access services, but there's equally some work that we need to do with the wider team and how that develops, and knowing who you can signpost to. You know, I know I can refer to a physio, I know I can refer to a dietitian, but I'm not sure that my community pharmacy colleagues have these same referral pathways. You know, it goes back to what you're talking about, yellow pages. We have had books like that for health professionals, like Refer with Confidence, that allows health professionals to know where is the appropriate place to signpost. And also, as these, as these teams develop, the referral pathways will develop. So where we may not have been able to refer to another professional in the past, there's much more acceptance that I, as a pharmacist or a physio or a nurse, can refer into other people that we may not have been able to before. Clear. 
I need to declare an interest here as a, as a registered mental health nurse, uh, still registered with the Nursing Midwifery Council, because I want to ask a question about mental health. It's not something that we've touched on, but obviously plays a, a huge part in terms of the, the volume of presentations to primary care services. Um, how do you see the role of mental health supporting GPs, AHPs and so on in a primary care setting? I, I a very quick response to that, I think they will as well need to become an integral part of the team and will be part of the signposting options for, for patients. I think there, we already know there's a huge amount of mental um, mental illness, mental distress, emotional distress. We've got a spectrum and we need to be wise to how we deliver that service. Obviously, we have all just responded to the 10-year the, the mental health strategy and how that these, these issues will be delivered. I think key to all of this will be the interfacing and the network literacy that supports how we integrate with each other. I think the interface will be critical and, and absolutely mental health will be a crucial part of the primary care team as well. Before you answer, Linda, you said earlier that um, you lost the mental health nurses from your team. Could you maybe address that while you're answering, Claire? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the mental health nurses are key certainly out of hours and within general practice um, and we had mental health nurses within our team but workforce is an issue for mental health nurses too in terms of of, of having enough and and i suppose it's um sorry can i just ask me you see within your team what, what oh, team this is the out of hours team up in, in grampian um where, where we have a multidisciplinary team and within that team we had mental health nurses sitting with us uh, um overnight mm -hmm. which was um really good for the team and really good for, for patients. Um, but again, due to workforce changes, the team went down to our to Cornhill Hospital. Um, so now um, the, the patients are triaged or, or seen by a GP or a nurse with us, and then we refer on rather than the patient having direct access to that team. So it is work, workforce. Um, I think we need more mental health nurses. So um, why were they removed then? Why did they... Um, to support um, the team within the hospital at Cornhill. So there wasn't enough mental health nurses, they took them out of your team, put them into a um, hospital setting? Is that Essentially. Right? Okay. Uh, Miles? Um, can I just pick up on um, Claire's question? In terms of expanding um, beyond health professionals into the third sector, how is that relationship being built up so that people are being referred for social prescribing, for example? Um, before that becomes the next barrier that people aren't then sending people beyond sort of a hub team to other people who might actually be key to to addressing their health concerns. I think again, that's a, a, that's something that's very variable um, across a, across Scotland. Um, you know, my personal experience is very positive of that. We have um, third and voluntary sector representation within our multidisciplinary weekly team meetings in the mm -hmm. in the practice, and I absolutely know that's you know not the case and and I think again I think it's it, it is about um a recognition and um of I, I think the, the the health and social care partnership planning structure should facilitate that process I think that that's something that um whatever structure works within the context of the geography that it's being delivered will will, will direct how that will be done effectively mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's going to be a practical, you know, finding pragmatic solutions um, for the way forward. Um, several times um, people have mentioned that there's a um, shortage of the professions, uh, various professions. Um, we, we have a thousand approximate GP practices and funding for an additional 140 pharmacists and we're supposed to be rolling out this hub model and uh, well potentially how on earth if we can't staff what we have the now are we going to roll this out or is this going to develop can you see that realistically happening without a huge injection of cash from somewhere yeah. i think it's back to the point that was made earlier um, we need to be able to sustain these things so it's 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 not having funding for for one year but looking at how we can um, sustain these models and and offer substantive posts to people but but 
But in saying that, um, I know there is difficulties in, in some areas in recruiting nurses to the to their universities to actually um, um, complete training. Um, I don't know what it's like for for pharmacy, but but yes, we have to encourage people to to think about um, healthcare services, um, social care, caring, um, to encourage them to come into that profession and and make it a profession that they they want to join and, and be proud of. From a GP perspective, as you know, the um, I mean, obviously. Um, the direction of travel is the wrong direction. We're actually reducing the, the number of GPs um, th are, are reducing. In fact, effectively, we're about you know we're facing a huge retirement um, bulge, which we've been you know have been highlighting now for as much as ten years that that was coming. And um, there are a number of challenges in terms of recruiting into general practice for GPs. I mean, we've just um, we've just I think as, as Shan alluded to earlier, we've just launched our Think GP to try and encourage and to um, promote what a, an attractive um, career option is for doctors to come into general practice. But there are some fundamental challenges with recruiting um, through the system. Um, we recognise that there are only approximately slight well slightly over approximately half of our medical students um are scotland domicile um and therefore we have a big challenge with retaining the number of medical students that are being trained in scotland um and we're also in, and it's really going to be important to increase the amount of general practice exposure within undergraduate training so that, um, in order to encourage direction into our specialty um so i think in terms of, we have had, um, you know, a hundred new places um, for training places that have been um, created and have now been advertised um, and are in the process of appointment. Um, but unfortunately, um, we are not filling, going to fill these places um, or anything like it. And in fact, we've still got a number of um, unfilled places for GP training that um, from the previous recruitment round. So, so we are not attracting um, potential GP, future GPs at this point in time. And it's our role in the college to do everything we can to promote that at every stage in our career flow um, process. Um, uh, um, but it is a, a real, real challenge and a real, real concern. Um, and it's very difficult to see how we can sustain models both in and out of ours of the whole team, including GPs, without a shift of resources into primary care to support that. Um, I, I'm, is, is the very sort of absolute answer to your initial question. Yeah, Aline. Um, I think you're right, 140 pharmacists across 1,000 practices in Scotland is not really going to go very far. But I think this, this is a lot about, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about transformation and a lot of this is about doing things differently. And it's about utilising the resource that we have to the best of its ability, you know, so utilising the skills of pharmacists and all the other professionals as well. I think in, a, in the earlier session, somebody talked about the prescribing demands. We know that 50% of medication is not taken as the intended prescribed. And I know when I go into people's houses on a day-to-day -day basis, there are bucket loads of medication that's not taken as prescribed. So, you know, we need to start talking to people about what is it they want from their health, what outcomes do they want. You know, because if you think about it in the longer terms, if we, if we deliver the care properly, then some of that workload will naturally reduce because we're actually giving people the services that, that they want. You know, so we're currently looking at how do we deliver services based on the current demand. But actually, that doesn't necessarily mean that the current demand is, is the right demand as time goes on. So I think things will change as, as the years go on. So do any, any of you have evidence of that? change happening where you know people are no longer sitting by buckets of um, medicines and tablets is that yes, I mean, as a GP, one of the things that has facilitated that is the introduction of uh, pharmacy technicians into practices and pharmacy technicians are going out to people's homes they are doing exactly that looking at the medications they're looking at delivery systems they're um, um, working with their uh, pharmacy colleagues um, explore, you know looking at medications and prescribing I mean, obviously, um, the whole issue of realistic medicine and the CMO's um, report is is, this, is is the reminder to all of us that that's actually, I mean, if it's fundamental to general practice, we would, we, you know, that's what we do. We look at patients' needs and prescribing and look at it in the context of the whole patient. And we look to be much more realistic um, in what's being, um, what's being prescribed. I think moving away from our, qual qual um, our quality and outcomes framework um, will be, 
facilitate that process. A lot of prescribing was target driven um, and so that's going to rationalise prescribing. So there will be changes very much within how we deliver care um, and, and being more efficient with the support that we need to ensure patients are actually following what's expe you know what, what they should be and they're informed appropriately to do that um, will be really important. We do have data from you know like some of the some of the work that we've been doing in care homes and so on, where we've looked you know we've gone in and we've done medication reviews as a multidisciplinary approach, and we can see through time what happens in terms of the amount of medication that's prescribed for people. I have data on the number of high risk medicines that have been stopped, the number of untreated conditions that we've started treatment for, um, and the costs as it changes through time. So that, that the data is there, and as we as we develop more and more of those models, then that that data will get more robust. Okay, and sorry. And of course, it's not just medicines. There's dressings as well. Mm -hmm. A huge amount of um, cost around dressings, and certainly locally, we have done a piece of work around um, when you write a prescription. That dressing belongs to that patient, so they could have a box of forty dressings, and they might need two, so it belongs to that patient. So, I know other areas will have done the same looking at and this is just one large practice within our area and we can save a thousand pounds per month by doing things differently so so areas are, are looking you know at best ways to serve the patient and also um cost okay effective. anybody any final points to the panel no thank you very much uh thanks very much for attending this morning uh, and as agreed we agreed we will now move into private session Thank you very much.